dawn of social media was a more innocent time. Friendster launched in 2002 as one more profile to fill out with favorite movies and pseudo-profound quotes. When Facebook opened itself for public access a few years later, it was populated by college students looking for dates, not bigots spreading fake news. Initial skepticism about Twitter revolved around its navel-gazing, breakfast-commemorating inanity, rather than fears it could fuel the rise of demagogues. But MySpace always felt different. When it went live in 2003, it fused the sulky alternative aesthetics of Web 1.0 networking slash hookup platform Makeout Club with the vast membership base of Friendster. For indie kids of all stripes, the formula proved irresistible. True to its name, the endlessly customizable platform allowed users to curate profiles that looked more like poster-covered bedroom walls than resumes. A feature called Top 8 had everyone from nerds to metalheads indulging their inner mean girl by ranking their best friends and favorite bands on a wonkily-shaped grid. Scenesters who claimed to own a copy of Vampire Weekend sought after blue CDR were simply listening to its contents on MySpace and throwing the band into their top eight. Kids in the middle of nowhere could digitally cosplay Baltimore art punks, tricking out their page with homages to Beach House and Ponytail. Best of all, you could post songs that would play for anyone who clicked on your page, making MySpace both a minefield of adolescent sentiments too potent to be contained in the text of an aim away message, and the only major social media site that has ever catered explicitly to music fans. MySpace arrived at just the right time to capitalize on the early 21st century's most distinctive teen musical subculture, emo. Bands like Panic at the Disco and Hawthorne Heights soared to popularity on the service. And for emo kids of every gender, a profile selfie flaunting the right combination of bangs, eyeliner, and tortured pout became as crucial an accessory as a dashboard confessional lyric tattoo stretched over a scrawny ribcage. More than a decade after MySpace reached its peak, emo nostalgia obsesses over this aesthetic. A self-proclaimed movement called Taking Back Emo, throws dance parties with names like MySpace Emo Prom across the Midwest, and personal essays reminiscing about life as a mid-aughts emo kid invariably shout out the site. But in truth, the site launched plenty of noteworthy careers in other genres. After building a following on MySpace, Arctic Monkeys broke records when their 2006 debut album, Whatever People Say I Am, That's What I'm Not, sold 360,000 copies in the UK during its first week out. The previous year, pop star Lily Allen became a surprise sensation after posting mixtapes on her page. MySpace plays would help Fleet Foxes earn a coveted sub-pop contract. Especially for bands without publicists or label support, MySpace became crucial for publicizing tour dates and communicating with fans. The site helped metal genres coalesce and indie rappers find their people. As befits the most emo of superstar rappers, MySpace even facilitated Drake's fateful first meeting with Lil Wayne. It was a game changer for established artists, too. Nearly a decade before Beyonce broke the internet by announcing an album drop via Instagram, R.E.M. previewed their 2004 record Around the Sun on MySpace, in a move Billboard characterized as the first such initiative involving the social networking portal. It was a canny marketing strategy, for fans, that early access to their idols' new music felt like a personal gift, and it paved the way for the advanced streams that have since become virtually required for artists looking to build their audiences. As the past several years have proven, no social media site is perfect. MySpace never devolved into a dystopian cesspool of Russian bots and psychotic trolls. But for all its subcultural cachet, MySpace was initially a project of the digital marketing company eUniverse, and Rupert Murdoch bought it in 2005. Four years later, Facebook surpassed the site in total users, and the rest is history. Despite Justin Timberlake's purchase of an ownership stake in MySpace and failed attempt to revive it explicitly as a music portal in 2013. Since then, online music discovery has become a bigger business than ever. It's enough to make you long for the days of seeing your crush's conspicuous obsession with the pains of being pure at heart, or nights you spent studiously checking out every band followed by Bradford Cox of Deer Hunter. MySpace was not only fan to fan, but artist to artist, fan to artist, and back. A recommendation engine so unfiltered it was almost primitive. While Spotify's Discover Weekly feature 
Pandora's instantly populating stations, and YouTube's recommended video columns all have their merits. They lack the individual human touch of social media's more unsettled early days. When finding a new favorite band was as easy as stumbling down the MySpace rabbit hole and into Wonderland.